Hello again everybody, and today we're going to talk about the ancient fortress of Pur Bajin. Pur Bajin is located in the middle of Lake Terikol in the Tuva region of Russia, almost on the border of Russia and Mongolia. The fortress was discovered in the 17th century by the famous cartographer Semyon Rezmanov, who I've spoken about in previous videos and we've probably all heard his famous book, The Drawing Book of Siberia, but uh, Porbegine Fortress was was featured in that book. The fortress itself is hidden in, in amongst all these mountains that you can see here and sits at a height of 1300 metres with the nearest settlements over 700 kilometres away. Translated from the local language, Pur Bajin, Bajin literally means clay house. The fortress was studied extensively in the 18th century by the Russian archaeologist D.A. Clements, who noted that the builders of this place were, in his words, neither Mongols nor Chinese, and hardly Kitan or Gurungai, most likely the same or related to the people who built the ancient city of Karkorum. As you can see by the, the surrounding area of Pur Bajin, it's, it's fairly well isolated, hidden right in amongst these mountains. This is Lake Terrico here. And you can see it's a, a, an extremely isolated region. Like I said, the nearest settlement is over 700 kilometres away. In 2007, Vladimir, President Vladimir Putin and Prince Albert II of Monaco visited Pur Bajin. And for such important people to visit such a remote and obscure fortress is extremely bizarre. Unless there's a version of history which we are not aware of, a version of history known only to the elites. On his visit, President Putin said, I've been to a lot of places and seen a lot of things, but I've never seen anything like this. The fortress, like I said, was, was studied extensively in the 18th century and the mid-60s. Other than that, it has is, is been fairly left alone. There was a resurgence in modern times and in the early 2000s where the area was once again studied but since then it has been, been left to ruin with little to no conservation efforts being put in place. The fortress itself has been a constant source of frustration for historians and archaeologists and nobody could come up with a substantial region as to why a fortress would be built in the middle of nowhere, let alone in the middle of a lake. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the researchers concluded that the fortress was constructed sometime in the late 8th century. They actually put a date on it as 777 AD and belonged to the Uyghurs, based solely on the fact that the topography looks similar to the capital of Orkhon Uyghurs in the city of Ordubalik. You can see here that it's, it's in a fair state of disrepair. This here is, is actually a, a massive pile of tiles that have been neatly stacked up and left prior to whoever occupied this fortress leaving. And it appears they left in quite a hurry because not only were these tiles left neatly piled up, but the blacksmith also had a hundred blanks that had yet to be forged. The ruins themselves occupy almost every square inch of the island that it sits on and the fortress, like I said, is almost perfectly orientated to the four cardinal directions. The height of the fortress walls surrounding it, although severely damaged, can still rise to 12 metres at points, and the fortress itself has a dimension of 211 by 158 metres. The thickness of the external walls themselves, now this is a, a, an amazing part, reaches more than 10 metres thick. At some points they, they, they are actually 15 metres thick, and at other points they go as low as 8, but, but they average out at about 10 metres in thickness. And you can see the level of construction here is fairly advanced if no very advanced. At one point there existed, as you can see, a fortified gatehouse on the eastern wall. Now very very few trace elements of a settlement have been found in this area. There have been a few fragments of ceramic and stone dishes as well as iron nails that have been found here. Uh, spoke about the, the tiles that were neatly piled up and the blacksmith blanks, but other than that there is very 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 little in the way a archaeological artefacts. In the very centre of the fortress there were two earthen mounds that were excavated in 1963 and they revealed the base of two separate buildings. 
these buildings were were vast and why they were covered up in earth remains a mystery to this day. Historians have since concluded that these buildings were a palace and a temple, with the exterior of these walls being over one metre thick. Now the local Tuvan people of Purbegine tell of the fortress initially being built in an area that had no lake, and the lake formed around the fortress during the construction. Uh, the can was building a well, the can was digging a well and water sprung forth from that well, causing the can to run in fear and filling this area up with water, creating the lake terrible. The Tuvan shamans also claim that Purbegine is basically the northern entrance to Shambhala. Now, historians have not only struggled to explain this here is just a, a plan a uh, what poor regime was supposed to look like, this here is a recreation, but historians have not only struggled to explain why poor regime was built in this area, but also how, because over 1,000 tonnes of material, 1,000 tonnes of uh, uh, brickwork would have been needed to trans be transported to this island, and where they came from, where they were created, and how they got to the island remains a mystery to this day. The factories for making bricks have never been found, and in fact, the northernmost trade route, the northernmost point of the famous Silk Road, passes over a thousand kilometres to the south of Purbegine. As we can see here, there is massive piles of eh, block work and tiles that have yet to this day been explained. We have no idea what these structures originally looked like, nor their sophistication, and mainstream historians and archaeologists again have no explanation as to why this was destroyed, nor why it was left. Another significant fact about this area that I, I touched on is the fact that there's little to no cultural layer with some ceramics and a single single uh, blacksmith with a, a hundred blanks, they've, they've found very little. They've found a couple of pieces of jewellery, a couple of bits of ceramic and dishes and, and that is literally it. To this day there have been found no graves on the site nor in the surrounding area with the exception of one which we'll speak about later. Scientists have found, and we'll see a picture there later, traces of a road and a quarry at the bottom of the lake. And also evidence, or so they say, geologists say, that the lake was drained several times over the year. From this they have concluded that it must have been the result of earthquakes. And at one point the earthquakes closed off the spring that filled the lake, which drained it. And then it had another earthquake which opened up the spring which filled it. I don't know how realistic that seems to you guys, but I have a, a fairly hard time believing that the, the chances of that happening actually occurred. They claim that this earthquake was not only responsible for the destruction of the fortress, but also the reason that everybody left. And now how everybody could leave in the middle of an earthquake and nobody got hurt and no bodies had been found, that seems a wee bit baffling to me. Now like I said, in modern times, we'll jump to it quickly, in modern times, uh, we've revealed even more structures in the surrounding area. There have been runic runic stones found on the shores as well as underwater underwater structures. An underwater road, an underwater quarry and this structure that you can see right here. I'll just jump back to where we were. Now the history of this fortress is definitely up in the air with many historians disagreeing with one another. The official story we're told is based on extremely flimsy evidence at best and at worst hearsay and speculation. What we do know is that this fortress lies in an area that had long since been inhabited by the Slavic Aryan people, and therefore it wouldn't be too much a stretch to conclude that the lack of history surrounding this fortress is evidence to suggest that it belonged to that very same people, this being but a small remnant of a once vast empire, the Tartarian Empire. Not only might this fortress be the remnants of this, this very same Slavic Aryan Empire, but it might also be the exact location a, a very famous event that I mentioned in a previous video, the creation of the world and this Star Temple. This, I believe, could be the location of the very Star Temple itself. Now, ancient legends tell that the, the fabled Star Temple was signed in the infamous Unfound unknown to this day, city of Kitsi. This city, which many historians believe to be a fable, has never been found and its supposed location is the basis for, for many disagreements. According to ancient descriptions, the city of Kitsi was located in the middle of a lake and remained in perfect condition until it was attacked by Batu Khan. The fortress measured 100 by 200 sajin, which is an old unit of measurement, and almost perfectly matches the dimensions of Purbegine. This is one of the few remains found in the area along with, along with that 
uh, I think that's a gutter seal, a drain seal, which is apparently in the Chinese style. Upon attacking and attempting to take the fortress, Batu Khan was shocked to find that he met no resistance. The locals instead began to pray. When nearing the city gates, legend tells that masses of water began to rise from fountains around the city, flooding everything up with metre meter upon metre of water, forcing a retreat by the Khan's forces and leaving only the tip of the dome at the centre of the city sticking out of the water. Now this sounds like the exact same legend that the locals have as to the origin of Lake Terracol. These legends align with the fortress of Porbergine, and like I said, even align with the, the very same legend that the locals claim created this lake. In a more modern expedition to the area, 1963 again, archaeologists came upon the site of a single burial, a single grave which was unearthed due to an apparent earthquake. It was called the Grey Grave. The grave was immediately identified as belonging to a warrior. However, the items in the grave and the person in it were clearly of European descent. The bone structure and height of the skeleton gave this away, along with the fact it was buried with a sword covered in runic ins uh, a sword and a shield covered in runic inscriptions, as well as a spear. The knight was dressed in chainmail. The date scientists estimate the warrior met his fate also adds to the mystery, as he claimed he died in the 14th to the 15th century, by which point Purbegine had long since been uninhabited. I believe it is well known amongst the elite that this is the site of the famous Aryan Star Temple and explains the visits by not only putting in the Prince of Monaco but a, a lot of other important dignitaries and why they would go to such an extreme and remote location. In the winter months this is accessible only by helicopter and in the summer months you need specialised off-road vehicles just to make it here. Unless mainstream sources admit to what I believe, uh, or independent research is allowed to be carried out in this area, it is unlikely that we will ever find out the truth. It should be noted that to this day, zero conservation work has ever been has ever been enacted or taken place, and archaeologists admit themselves that it is slowly being uh, uh, destroyed by erosion, especially after modern excavations. What I find interesting about this photo of Burbagine, this apparently is, is a local sort of sign of respect but these stone slabs here look almost identical to the Devil's Hill Fort that we've seen in our previous video the Devil's Hill Fort in Siberia these vast stone slabs and we can see how bad the, the erosion is here because that's that's the the holes in which the beams for roofs would have been set in and this is a structure not just a mound of mud it also shows how many of these structures that mainstream sources, mainstream archaeologists claim that nothing but mud could actually have been st structures, artificial. This is the the remains of the ancient gate. Now, Tuvan legends also tell that this is not only the site of uh, the northern entrance of Shambhala, but also the grave of Genghis Khan. Could that have been the grave of the warrior that was unearthed by archaeologists in the 60s? We have yet to find out. This is some ancient tiles again found in the 1963 ex expedition, which will sadly be lost to time unless anything is done. This fortress is very quickly been lost, very quickly been eroded, and very quickly been forgotten about. There was a big resurgence in 2000, and I believe it was 2006 and 2007, to to turn this into a, a, a temple, a monastery. However, that has since fell through, and nothing has been carried out. No work has been carried out. We can see that it is clearly a very interesting area. The underwater structures, road quarry, as well as the fortress itself, tell us that. Why there is no research ongoing, we have, well, it remains to be determined. Just a wee quick video, but until the next time, I hope you guys enjoyed it. This fortress, to me, is exceedingly interesting. If you go on the internet and do some research for yourself, you'll find some more fantastic foes and even more legends. The, the Tuvan legends, the legends of the Tuvan shamans, are, are by far the most interesting aspect of this story. Until next time, peace.